Hi, I'm Dr. Deepak Suraparaju. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon. I'd like to talk to you about COVID-19. Before I begin, I have a couple of disclaimers. Number one being that this is not designed for the experts in the field. It has been designed for students, for support staff in the hospitals and for the public at large, for them to get a better understanding of what we are dealing with, with regard to this pandemic. And I believe that would help them in preventing the disease and also to allay some fears that are associated with this disease. Number two is that all the pictures and videos I've used are non-copyrighted and are free to use. And for the ones that are not, due credit has been given on the respective slides. Before I get into what we are going to talk about, let me first tell you what we are not going to talk about. We are not going to talk about how to identify this disease, investigate or even manage it. We are not going to talk about conspiracy theories associated with it. We are predominantly here to talk about prevention. Step in successfully preventing this disease is to first understand what this disease is, what is causing this disease. To begin understanding that, let us first size up our enemy. This is a human hair. This is about 60 micrometers in diameter. When you zoom into some dust on your hair, the dust or pollen is about 10 micrometer in diameter. That is bacteria and that is about 2 micrometers in diameter. Red on top of the bacteria is a virus. Most often they are less than 1 micrometer in diameter. So viruses are among the most primitive of beings. They are considered non-living when they are left to their own accord. Bacteria on fungus, which are other kinds of germs that also affect us, can survive on their own or even reproduce on their own by using their resources around them. But a virus is very specific to what it likes and its only purpose in life is to multiply. It cannot survive on its own accord and if left to itself on several surfaces, it, it often dies very quickly. With this virus, up to 72 hours is what is believed that it survives on plastics and metal surfaces. But even on these surfaces, they readily die with simple disinfectants, soaps, or because they need a host cell to survive. One such virus that's wrecking havoc right now and causing the pandemic is only about 0.1 micrometer in diameter. And that is the SARS-CoV-2 virus causing COVID-19 disease. And this virus belongs to a family called Corona. And there are lots of other Corona viruses which are also known to affect human beings. One famous example is the influenza virus, which causes the common cold. In the initial days of the pandemic, it was believed that this virus also causes symptoms that are similar to common cold. And there is not much of difference in terms of recovery and mortality rate with this disease. It seems so in the initial stages, but as the disease progressed and the understanding about it became more clear, it became more obvious that there are large differences between how these two pan out in the human body. So this is a chart from the CDC, which compares the common flu versus COVID-19. Even though they're part of the same family of viruses. So we will look at first the R0 number. So this number indicates how many people one infected person can spread this virus to on an average. With the flu, it is 1.3 and with COVID-19, it is about 2.5. The number doesn't seem very large unless, until you multiply it into 10 generations. For flu, it would become 56 people and with an R0 of 2.5, it would make COVID-19 over 2000 people in 10 cycles. So that is what is worrying us because with the flu, even in a season, if several people get flu, the number of people they're going to spread it to and the number of people requiring hospital admissions are going to be much lesser 
as compared to COVID-19 where the number of people coming into the hospitals are overburdening the system and especially a system that is not well prepared. The other big difference fatality rate. For the common flu it's only about 0.1 percent and for COVID-19 it's it's been a large average but it is difficult to exactly say the absolute percentage as of now because we do not really have the complete number of people infected. Right now the numbers we have are based on the amount of tests we are doing. So if the testing increases and you find out that there are large larger amount of population which is not you know resulted in fatality maybe this percentage would come down but in India currently it's about 2.6 to 3 percent yet that is as soon as you get the virus how long does it take for you to become symptomatic there is a big difference between these two also hospitalization rates there has been a dramatic increase as compared to flu with COVID-19 so all this only tells you that it is definitely more dangerous than the flu predominantly because of its mortality and also because of how contagious it is. Now we will get into what we are here to talk about. We are here to talk about prevention and there is one slide that I would like you to concentrate on before we get further into the presentation and that is the chance of infection. The chance of you getting infected is dependent on three factors viral load, the environment and time. I would like you to remember this and keep this in your mind through your everyday life. You will very soon understand why. So let's first deal with one at a time. Viral load to begin with, then time and then environment. What is viral load? So the number of viral particles that are needed for you to get infected. So there is growing consensus that this number is about 1000 viral particles. When the virus is so small, 1000 is not a big number. So to know what exposes you to 1000 viruses, let us go to the next slide. So this is a clip of uh, Mr. Matthew Stamets. He's a scientist. Who, may, who created a lab in his own, own garage where he used specialized you know, camera techniques to, to identify the particles that leave a person's mouth when they cough, when they talk, when they breathe and several other uh, situations which we will also discuss later on. So from this, it is clear about how the particles leave your mouth. And we already know that on an average, breathing releases about 20 viral particles per minute and talking about 200 viral particles per minute and about and this would mean that if you are in front of somebody who is infected and he is breathing and not covering his mouth it would take you about 50 minutes and if he's talking and not covering his mouth and nose it would be about five minutes before you are exposed to thousand viral particles but what is more alarming is coughing and sneezing. One cough or one sneeze is believed to expel about 200 million viral particles. So that would mean that one single episode of cough or a sneeze from an uncovered mouth or nose would be more than enough or get you infected several times over. So when, when you understand that this, you would know that what kind of danger you are in when you are in front of somebody who isn't wearing a cover over his nose or mouth. So how can we avoid an infection? We have heard from the government and the, the news about measures that one can take to avoid infection. But here we are going to discuss about why we need to take these measures and how important are these for your safety and the safety of your family members. We will discuss about why you need to socially distance, why you need to wear a mask and which mask to wear, why should you wash your hands and why would someone use a face shield. This is a simulation of a person coughing. 
There are several particles that leave a patient's mouth and nose. They're broadly divided into particles like the respiratory droplets and aerosols. What you see in blue is aerosols and the others are respiratory droplets. These droplets can be as large as 500 micrometers and as small as 5 micrometers. If you remember, SARS-CoV-2 is 0.1 micrometer in diameter. And these viruses piggyback on these respiratory droplets, which is actually moisture. So if you notice this simulation, you would notice that majority of the respiratory droplets fall in a short distance in front of the mouth as they leave a person when the person's face is uncovered. And these aerosols can remain in the air for several hours. Most of these respiratory droplets have been found to drop within three to six feet from the person who is coughing with an uncovered nose and mouth. This is the reason why you've been asked to maintain social distance. And the, dist the magic number is about two meters. Although the particles and aerosols can travel much farther than that, so how to prevent when you have already social distance, how do you prevent infection when you are farther than two meters? To understand that, we will get into the next question, which is why masks and which masks? There are several kinds of masks that exist. There are bandanas, there are handkerchief, there are fancy cloth masks, there are two ply masks, three ply masks and, and N95 masks. So you must remember that there is only one mask that prevents you from getting an infection directly and that is an N95 mask. These are very hard to come by and, and there the government is not recommending this to everybody because, because of the lack of availability for healthcare staff who are at extreme high risk of exposure from taking care of patients with COVID-19 and they come labeled as N95, KN95, FFP2, etc. And but these are the only masks that prevent actual viral particle floating in the air from getting into your nose and mouth. And there are a lot of questions as to how long to use these masks and, and, and these questions are still not very clearly answered. But as a rule, what we follow is we have about four masks with us and we keep them in separate Ziploc uh, bags and label them one, two, three, four and recirculate these masks till they become soiled or difficult to breathe in. So that way we know that the virus does not survive on its own for a long time. So maximum it survives for about 72 hours. So we recirculate on the fourth day. But irrespective of this, what is uh, more important is that any mask is better than no mask. This is a video that, that gives out that message. So a person with an uncovered face coughing versus a person wearing just a cloth mask coughing. You can notice that the, the particles, the moisture is leaving the person with a cloth mask, but it is diffuse and the velocity at which these particles leave the person's face is much lesser as compared to a person with an uncovered face. Now you, I have told you about any mask being better than no mask. The next most important thing about masks is an ill-fitting mask is worse than no mask at all. The reason I say that is a, a person wearing a mask but not wearing it properly gives him a false sense of being protected. And these people generally tend to be more courageous and more brave with the kind of things they do. They wear an ill-fitted mask and get into crowds and get into restaurants and fly or, or travel where they pose extreme high risk to themselves and to the people around them. So it is not just about wearing a mask. It's about wearing a well-fitted mask. This is an example of what an ill-fitted mask does. It is equivalent to not wearing anything at all. So what you need to understand from this is any mask is better than no mask n95 mask is better than all other masks and a well-fitted mask is the only way to do 
Now we get into the third question about hand wash. So why do we have to wash our hands? The virus cannot penetrate your intact skin. In fact, the virus is a respiratory virus, so it prefers using your nose and your mouth to get into your lungs. But then why are we washing our hands? The main reason for it is there may be viral particles lying about on surfaces that your hands may touch. And when you're wearing a mask, you have a tendency to constantly touch your face to readjust the mask, to try and uh, get it back into place, to pull it down, to take a breather or to talk to somebody which is wrong. So inadvertently, you take the virus on the surface of your hand and introduce it to your own eyes, nose or mouth from where the virus can get access into your lungs. So to prevent this, is why you need to wash your hands. So there is a proper technique to wash your hands. If you don't do this, just like how you need to have a well-fitted mask for it to work properly, you need to use a proper technique to wash your hands. Only then it is effective. And this information is freely available over the internet where you can search for proper hand wash technique and follow those steps to get into every crease and crevice of your hand and to get and to kill the virus. The same rules apply even for while using sanitizers. And th there are interviews of doctors who have been handling COVID positive patients for several weeks and have successfully not gotten infected. Majority of them, when you ask them for tips, they tell you that one of the biggest tips they followed is they were always aware of where their hands were at all times. They kept an eye on their own hands to know if that, that they do not touch anything that may have high viral load and they immediately keep wash their hands or sanitize them so that they don't spread the infection to them. So talk about face shields. Here is a simulation of a person coughing without a mask or of a face or nose covered and another person about 0.5 meters in front of him. That is within the safety distance. You notice that most of the respiratory droplets that are coming straight for the person's face are blocked by the face shield while the aerosols can easily get in from the sides of the face shields. Then why are we wearing the face shield? So the face shield by itself sta as a standalone measure is of absolutely no use. You need to use it along with a face mask, preferably an N95 mask. So when do you use these face shields? Whenever you are likely going to, going to be in close contact with other people who may or may not be infected, would be an ideal situation. Like for example, traveling by flights, traveling in crowded buses or trains, or especially in hospitals where there may be other people coughing around you. So a face shield will stop the largest particles which carry the largest number of viruses in them from hitting your face directly and getting into your eyes or nose or mouth. Now that we have discussed viral load, now we'll get into the second thing that could affect your chances of getting infected, and that is time. As a general rule, it is recommended that you be in a hurry wherever you go other than your own house. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you can leave quickly, do it. Why you need to do that? is because the virus is after you and you need to get out of there as quickly as possible. For example, going to the supermarket. It's always advisable to go for frequent short visits than to go for long and infrequent visits because of the time you spend in that place. Even when, when we discussed viral load, we also spoke about how many viral particles are are exit a person's, an infected person's mouth when they breathe and talk. For talking, it was five minutes. So you must have a cutoff of about five to 10 minutes maximum if you're wearing a well-fitted mask before you leave whichever place you are in other than your house. Now we come to the third factor which can influence your chance of infection and that is environment. 
Indoors, poor cross ventilation, crowded places are all examples of bad environments. This image is a classical example of one such bad environment. There it is indoor, there is poor cross ventilation because of recirculation of air, and there is a large number of people sitting in, in, in a closed enclosed area. But they don't always have to all exist together. Like for example, a concert. You are outdoors, there is good cross ventilation, but when the crowd, when there is a lot of crowd, the chances of you getting infected is still very high. What are examples of good environments? Being outdoors where there are less people with good cross ventilation. So outdoor is better than indoors. Good cross ventilation is better than poor cross ventilation and less people is better than more people. There are a couple of take home messages. So this slide is what I want you to remember even if everything else is forgotten. The chance of you getting infected is dependent on viral load, time and environment. During this presentation, we spoke about how to reduce viral load. That is by socially distancing, by wearing a well-fitted mask, by washing your hands frequently and not touching your face, and by wearing a face shield when necessary. Time, as quickly as possible, get away from where you are. Environment, outdoors, less crowds and good ventilation is good. You are the bomb. The fire is COVID-19 and the fuse is the time COVID-19 takes to get to you. Your goal should be to delay your infection. Why should you delay your infection? Because this pandemic is relatively new. The understanding about the disease is still not clear. With time, we hope that better medications, better protocols to manage sick patients, a possible vaccine, better investigative methods, and better understanding of the disease in general will be available as time passes. So that is why you need to delay your infection for as long as possible. Stay safe, follow all the things that you have learned today and thank you for your patient listening.